Hello everybody, a nice cup of tea with an alpaca. How are you all? Welcome to today's Easy 11 Plus Live lesson on short answer comprehension. It may seem like an easy task when you get a comprehension exercise with quite short, simple looking answer spaces, but as we'll see today, it often isn't. Let's get started. So let's have a start by looking quickly at the text. Now, I am not going to read through the text now, for one thing it's rather long. However, as you'll see during the lesson, reading the text before you look at the questions is super important. It makes an enormous difference and without it you can get into a real tangle. So always read the text before you start answering the questions in full. When you read the text you want to get an overall understanding, you want to know what's happening where broadly, and you want to know who the characters are so you don't get them tangled up. These are the main things to fix the first time that you read the text. It might be worth rewinding that, bit of, rewinding that bit of the video and hearing me say that again because those are really important things when you look at a comprehension text. I'm not going to read it now, I'm going to assume that you've read it. Um, just in case you haven't read the text yet, and I know there was someone in the comments saying, in the live chat comments saying they didn't even know what the lesson was about. So if you haven't looked at the worksheet yet, I strongly recommend you go into the video description under the video, download the worksheet, there's a link there, and give the text a read before you carry on with this lesson. Um, or watch the lesson and then, whoops, go back and read the text and have a go yourself at the questions. Now, let's plunge in. So, um, question 1a. Write down two different nouns from the text that mean that the landscape is empty. So always look at the detail. Noun, so you know what a noun is. Okay, it's a, a thing word, like a name, but it can also be the name of an idea, like hunger. Whereas hungry would be an adjective, a, des um, a describing word, a hungry person. Uh, but you know what a noun is, we won't go into detail on that now. Uh, different, important, so not the same word twice, even if it appears in the text twice, obviously, anyway, that mean that the landscape is empty. So we go into the text and we look through and we go, um, oh, I'm confused, mouse, pen, where am I? So we go through the text. And what should we go for? Nice blue. Um, and so the world extended to the moor edge. Nothing there, they're implying it's empty. Air the passages of earth and sky, blah, blah, blah. Nothing yet. A clear May noon illuminated the waste. Right, now this is a real vocabulary test because you need to recognize that a waste is like a wasteland, it's an empty space. And if you don't know that, then you're a bit stuck with this and you might spend a long time looking through. So one thing to say is short questions are sometimes short because they're testing quite high level skills like the vocabulary here and there's no easy way around that. Now because this is a bit of here's one I prepared earlier, I have actually looked at this, I'm going to tell you that the second word doesn't come in for quite a while and in fact you have to scroll beyond the screen that we have here. You don't get to another word that, as the question says, means the landscape is empty until line 15. Now, this is unusual. You will normally find that the first questions in a comprehension exercise are encouraging you to look at the beginning of the text and that they don't require you to dig way down. But that is what's usual. You do not know that that will be the case. And if you hadn't read the text in advance and didn't have an idea of what was happening where, you would now be stuck. You'll be reading through really carefully going, where's the word, where's the word? Maybe you'll be rereading the first paragraph several times. Always read the text first. Um, a few, um, lots of requests for shout outs coming in. I can't do all of them, but hi, Amina, a shout out for you, for Doris, for Diviesh. Um, all these people have asked for shout outs. That'll do for the moment. Um, uh, Haride said at the beginning, do you think he's going to make a mistake? I already made a bit of a mistake because when I was going through these questions about an hour ago, I realised that I'd actually chosen too many and this was going to take a bit of a long time. So I might not write down the answers for all of them, maybe to save a little bit of time. Um, John N in the comments said that um, his uh, son, I think, if I remember rightly, uh, find, finds this kind of question unusually hard. Um, it isn't unusual, they are hard, and as I'll keep pointing out as we go through, just because these questions look easy does not mean that they are. So finding these questions hard is normal. Getting all the marks in this little exercise would be very, very unusual. So that isn't something to panic about. It doesn't mean that there's any kind of profound problem. Um, you just need to identify where the mistakes are coming in and try and, and, try and 
build on the skills that will allow your son to do better in these questions, even if not yet perfectly. Um, I really don't think there's anything to panic about here. I normally choose slightly tricky things for my lessons so that I've got something to talk about. Um, so yeah, okay, so we've got waste and we've got desert. So now we go back to our answer sheet, getting into the rhythm of this. So quickly we've got waste and we've got desert. Oops, desert. Do not write because that means something different. What does that mean? It means like a trifle, a sponge cake, a dessert. Okay, desert has got one S. Uh, write down is a strong indication you don't need to provide a sentence answer. You can just write down the words, literally. And that's it. Okay, let's push on. Briefly explain why the author's decision to use the words Alvamica, I love you in the comments, Rob is the best teacher ever. That makes my evening, thank you. Um, and a shout out to Ivo or Ivo. Uh, briefly explain why the author's decision to use the words from A might be seen as surprising. Okay, so the words waste and desert. Give a different example from the text to support your point. Okay, so briefly means we don't need to add lots of explanation, we can just put it down quickly. Um, but we do need an example from the text. An example doesn't have to mean a quotation, but it really should, because that's the clearest way to give an example which will absolutely convince the examiner to give you a mark. And if you try to give an example by talking around a quotation without using quotation marks, why? Why not just quote? So we're looking for a short quote and a clear point that explains why it might seem surprising. So let's go back to the text. Again, I'm assuming that you've read this already, so I can skip through a little bit. So as we get to the second paragraph, we see that this doesn't sound like a desert or an empty space at all. We see that the hills and plains were still mottled with the winter coat. Oops, I'm crossing it out, not underlining it. Foolish boy. Um, were still mottled with the winter coat of the heather. So I'm spattered with chunks of colour here and there. Um, but even if you don't know what mottled is, you know there's a winter coat of heather, not very desert-like. And the verdure of the spearing glass has suffered diminution. Okay, so that's very complicated languages. Language, language, by the way. Um, you don't necessarily need to understand it, um, but it means that, yeah, the grasses weren't as green as they had been. Um, but the face of Dartmoor began to glow and the spring gorse leapt like a running flame along it. So that's more plants. We've got, by the water's brink was crowfoot and the heath had sky blue milkwort and violet and tormentor. I don't know what tormentor looks like, but it's obviously some kind of golden plant, which sounds very beautiful. Um, so, we've got lots of things here which do not seem very desert-like and do not seem like an empty landscape. Okay, we just need a brief example. Let's pick one. So, let's go with the heather in line six. Okay, so that's going to be our example to say the landscape doesn't seem empty like a wasteland. Uh, so, we're going to say, again, imagine, always imagine that you've got a friend there sitting opposite you as you write and you are explaining out loud in clear English what you want to communicate. So we're keeping it simple as though we're talking to somebody and if our friend is going, eh? then we haven't done it right. That's always the rule for this kind of thing. So there, there are lots of, you could say um, lots of, yeah, there are lots of colourful things Colourful living things, how's that? Lots of colourful living things such as the... Okay, now the quotation was mottled with the winter coat of the heather, but we can't say such as the mottled with the winter coat of the heather. It doesn't make sense, does it? And we, when we give quotations, they have to make sense as part of our sentence, so that even if we took away the quotation marks, it would still make sense as a continual continual, continual, continuous, continuous, that's the one, piece of English. Such as so, lots of colourful living things, such as the mottled, now we're going to skip some words, and I'm going to do that by putting dot, 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 mottled, no, in fact, let's just put mottled, coat of the heather. We could skip the as well, but let's not overcomplicate things. Such as the mottled coat of the Heather. Okay. Um, 
In fact, let's not put a source up, let's put a comma and carry on. So the landscape is not actually empty. Actually is kind of, it's an unnecessary word here, but it's a sort of strengthening word, essentially. Um, let's be a little bit clearer, that's a quotation mark, not the top of a semicolon. Yep, thank you very much. Um, so there are lots of colourful living things, such as the mottled coat of the heather, so the landscape is not actually empty. So the first part of our answer gives an example, mottled coat of the heather. It also adds some explanation of what that is, it's a colourful living thing. And the second part of our answer explains why this might be seen as surprising. So the landscape is not actually empty, as the words waste and desert and parte might have suggested. So this is a really short two-mark answer, but it takes quite a lot of thought to put it together and express it clearly in the space that's been given. Okay, on to part C, what's going in the comments? Loads of comments here, whoa. Um, everyone be nice to each other, people accusing other people of being rude. I don't know what people have said that's rude, but please don't do it, just be nice to each other. It should be a nice, relaxed, positive space. You're all great people because you're here to learn and want to do extra study for your 11 plus, which says wonderful things about you. So have some respect for each other, honestly. And be a bit more tolerant when people annoy you. Don't shout at them. Thank you very much. Um, um, interesting point. Um, Resthetic says, you must write as many lines for as many points. Three marks, three lines. It's an interesting idea. I personally do not agree with that. Um, I think you need as many things to tick as there are marks for the question. Um, and that's quite a different matter. So here it's not two lines for two marks, we need two things to tick, or we need to do all the things required by the question. So here the question tells us we need to explain why, we need to give an example, we need to make sure that it supports our point. If you do those things you'll get the marks, that's what counts. It's really easy to fill up lines with stuff that don't get any marks at all, people do that all the time. So I'm not sure about that, it isn't, it isn't about how much you write, although you do need to write a sensible amount, it's about doing the required things and saying enough things enough points, enough ideas to get the marks. Interesting contribution though, thank you. Um, um, Krishiv, a shout out for you. Uh, okay, if his choice of words to describe the landscape as empty is peculiar, why do you think the author has decided to use them in this story? <gasps> Answer briefly, but think about the whole passage. Well, this is a long question, time for some more tea. Visit from the alpaca. So, and this is exactly why I've already said several times that you must read the passage beforehand. And what was a major reason why I said this? I said you have to have an overall idea of what is going on. Because the whole of the first page of the text will not tell you the answer to this question. Why the author has described the landscape as like a desert even though it isn't. Now let's think about this. If the author says the landscape was bleak and like a desert, by the way, a desert doesn't need to be hot, so the um, the Antarctic is an example of a desert. Um, just a thought for you. Anyway, um, he describes it as a desert, but it isn't. It's got loads of beautiful plants in. So it must seem like a desert, even though it isn't. So whose perspective are we looking from? And it's only if you read on and you realise that really this is about Millie and this sturdy youth who's sitting with her. And we read on a bit more and we find out that these people are sad. Okay, this young woman, this young man, this girl and this boy, whatever you want to call them. Um, I think they're young enough that we can get away with either. Um, they probably seem terribly old to you and terribly young to me. That's the tragedy. Uh, anyway, so, um, yeah, so they are sad. And so that makes the landscape seem sad to them. Yeah. Um, so, the sim so simple answer that just gets the marks clearly. Oh, I need to go to the answer space, don't I? There we are. Just saved that one. Young couple are sad, excuse my handwriting as always, um, so the landscape seems bleak and empty to them. Is there anything 
more there that we need? No, I think that's fine. Um, that would explain why the author has used the words waste and desert, and so I think it does a good job. Uh, sorry, I've realised that whenever, with this setup I've got it, because I've moved house and everything's a bit different, whenever I put my elbows on the table like this, you get a kind of rumble up through the microphone, like a, a rumbling in the depths. I'll try to avoid doing it, but my apologies. Um, right, so simple, but it requires you to have read the whole passage first. Um, okay, um, um, Marsh has said, this is not full of things, but has a few things like the heathen. Deserts have plants and animals, but it is a kind of empty, not fully. Uh, just be careful that, um, I think that's a typo there, because um, heathen has a very biblical word, meaning the non-believers. Uh, you mean the heather, which is a plant, a little different. Okay, on to the next. What is meant by the phrase, ran over with it, in line four, be as specific as possible. Someone asked a little while ago, by the way, there's a good question, uh, which is what do you do um, when you don't know a word, and this is something people ask me all the time, um, look, when you don't know a word, you do your best. So you look in context and you try to work out what kind of thing that word is doing. If you just have to know it or there is no way of answering the question, then I think the answer is there for you. You just have your best go quickly, don't waste time on it, and move on. Um, but normally, you'll be able to get close to the meaning by working out what's happening in the text. And we actually come to that a bit later, I think, anyway, with more questions touching on that. What is meant by the phrase, ran over with it, in line four? Is this about running over some poor squirrel or something? Well, let's have a look. Um, so, um, ran over with it. What ran over with, with what? So we have to read, this is actually a good example, it's not a word that you don't understand, but it's a phrase that you probably don't understand in its own right, I wouldn't. Um, and we have to read what else is going on to work out what it means. So, a clear May noon, so midday, illuminated the waste, illuminated, illuminated, lumens, light, you know what that means. So, the midday sun um, in May lit up the, the wasteland, the desert, the landscape, and Dartmoor, a place, soaking her fill of sunshine, ran over with it. So that Devon's self-spread, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So what is it? It is the sunshine, yes? It is the sunshine, ran over with the sunshine. So Dartmoor soaked in her fill of sunshine, took as much as she could, and ran over with it, over, what does that make you think of? It makes you think of the word overflow. Okay, so if we were going to answer this really well, we'd say something like that, like that Dartmoor was so bright that it seemed to overflow with sunshine. But if you've got anything like that it's full of sunshine, that it's very full of sunshine, then we'll be absolutely fine there. So, so Dartmoor was so bright that it seemed to overflow with sunshine. Let's do that quickly. Um, no, I won't do that quickly. I've said it twice. If you need to find the answer, rewind. I just said it out loud. Let's move on so we don't take too much time. One more time. Dartmoor was so bright that it seemed to overflow with sunshine. Um, so saying it was so bright is a key bit of information for a mark and it seemed to overflow with sunshine gets the second mark because it really clearly shows that I understand what ran over with it means, which is the key phrase here, okay? Uh, if you said something, as I mentioned, like that it's too full or it's completely full with sunshine, that would probably be okay, but overflow would really get the meaning. Devon's self spread little darker of bosom than the grey and silver of high clouds lifted above her. This is so difficult. It is so difficult. Um, uh, look, people, if you're being rude to each other in the comments, which is just completely pointless, then we can't have a live chat in the lessons, which would be a great shame. Or maybe more simply, I'll just block you. So stop being rude. If someone is rude to you, just ignore it. Don't reply by being rude back. So that's why I'm, I'm looking at you answering back to whatever somebody said. Just don't, just let it go. Thank you. Comments have been nice for months. I don't know why people are kicking off now. Um, and I don't want to have to close the comments, but I will. Right. So what does this mean? Devon self spread a little darker bosom than the grey and silver of high clouds lifted above her. 
and we're over here in the text just by the top of my head on the screen. So, Demosov sped little darker of buzzer. If something is little something of something, so little more dum dum something, barely more, ah, so it was only a tiny bit more something than something. Okay, Devon self spread. Look, Devon is the place. Let's focus on that. So this place itself was barely darker of bosom now. We've got words there, the bosom, not a word for the, for the chest. So you're imagining that the landscape is like a person lying on their back and their chest is the rolling hill here. Uh, but you don't need to know that. Just focus on the key things. So we've got Devon. It's spread out. It isn't as dark. It, it is barely any darker than the grey and silver of high clouds. In other words, the sky. So actually, what does this boil down to? The landscape, the place, Devon, was barely darker than the sky. So we have to cut through all the extra words, all the horrible English, focus on the main meaning and write it clearer. What we haven't done there is gone through and translated every single word here. We said, what does this mean and how can we communicate that clearly as a whole? And that's crucial when we have to do something like this. So, dead simple. The landscape, okay, Devon self, its bosom and so on. The landscape, oops, man, there's a D in there, was barely, goodness me, my handwriting is just a disaster today. Someone says, what's the bosom? I hope I've just explained that. The landscape was barely darker. It doesn't ask us to explain in our own words, although obviously to explain we have to use our own words. We won't be penalised for saying darker. It was barely darker than the grey and silver of high clouds lifted above her, than the sky. Okay? Dead simple. The answer, but working it out, not so simple. Again, this is not an easy exercise, even though we're dealing with short answers. Right. Uh, question three. This is one that I think I might skip through a bit. So I'm going to talk about it, but I don't think I'm going to write the answer down here because I want to get a move on and not waste your time in this lesson by taking too long. So listen carefully. Um, because I think once I've explained what's going on here, it isn't too difficult to understand. It's getting to the answer here that's challenging. Reread lines 14 to 16. Okay, let's do that. Line 14, here we go. Lines 14 to 16, so that's this little bit. Let's go for a different color. Oh, green, why not? Okay, guess I need it. Running water and lifting lark made the music of this hour. Okay, so natural things making sounds were like music. And at one spot on the desert, a girl's voice mingled with them and enlarged the melody for it was gentle and musical and belonged to the springtime. I'll tell you what else is gentle and musical. It's the sound of people subscribing to my channel. So if you haven't already, please don't forget to click the red subscribe button under this video and the bell icon next to it. Thank you very much. I hope you like how I weaved that one in. Uh, right, so what's going on here? And the thing is, we have to explain why the author introduces the girl in this manner. But of course, the question doesn't tell us what in this manner is. So actually, although the question says why, implicitly, we also have to deal with the what, with what this manner is. In other words, how does the author introduce the girl? So this is really tricky because it isn't clearly worded. We are going to have to say briefly how the author introduces the girl, what's unusual about it, what's noticeable, and then explain why they do this. And without doing all those things, we, and we won't have explained our answers carefully. It just won't happen. So this is fiendish and very, very difficult in that way. I'm sorry, that's the way it is. It's a hard comprehension exercise, even though it may look quite easy. Let's go back to the text. Um, so what is this manner? Well, we're told about the music of the landscape, the water, and so on. Um, and then um, we are told about the girl whose voice comes out of this and becomes part of this natural music, as it were. Okay, so that's what's going on. So the key word here, I think, is, is um, 
is yeah is mingled the voice mingled with these sounds and joined the melody and also that she's really, really small she's just one spot in this landscape so what would I say? Why does the author introduce girl in this manner? So what is this manner to start with? So this manner is that the girl's voice mingles with the sounds of nature. And she seems small, occupying just one spot in the landscape. Okay, so that's what's going on here. There's natural sounds and the girl's voice mingles with them, comes out of them. And she's just one tiny little thing in this big landscape. Let's say that again. The girl's voice mingles with the sound of nature, and she seems small, occupying just one spot in the landscape. That's the first part of our answer that explains what's happening here. Notice I was going, I was doing bunny ears for the quotations. Notice if I hadn't done the bunny ears, my sentence would still have made perfect sense because the quotations fit into the sentence naturally. And that's really important that you use quotations like that. If they don't fit in naturally, you need to put your quotations in brackets. Now, why does the author do this? So we said that the girl seems to be, her sound seems to be coming out of nature. So in other words, she's made to seem not like a separate human thing living in city, popping into nature for walk on Saturday, going back to city, but no, that she seems to be part of this landscape in this natural world. And that's the impression that we get here. So we just need to say that the author wants us to see her as part of nature. Can we expand on that a bit with a bit more detail to link to the quotes? Yes, we can and we should. Let's go back. The author wants, to, wants us to see her as part of nature, an animal like a songbird coming to life in May or in spring. Now we've got a full answer that really thoroughly deals with this. I'm going to read it out one more time so you've got it, but without taking the time to write it down on my tablet. The girl's voice mingles with the sounds of nature and she seems small, occupying just one spot in the landscape. The author wants us to see her as part of nature, an animal like a songbird coming to life in May. Okay? So, tricky but very very achievable if you first break down what is happening what's interesting about it what are two short quotations to explain it and what effect does this create and then you have to imagine your friend sitting opposite you across the desk and you're going to explain this really hard thing to them in the simplest way that you can the simplest and clearest way it's always a mistake to try and make your ideas sound more complicated to be impressive. The impressive thing, this is not just 11 plus, this is your whole life, the impressive thing is when you can take difficult ideas and explain them in a really simple, direct way that anybody with ears can understand. And that is what's good. So simplicity is a sign of intelligence. I strongly believe that. Okay. Um, um, ah, PLE says, Robert, I don't understand why it said about manner. Okay. Um, oh, thank you for helping each other. So our aesthetic says uh, it's basically like in this way. Exactly. Manner means way. Why did you do that in that manner? Why did you do that in that way? And so on. Um, thank you for helping each other out in the comments. I'm sorry I wasn't clearer about that. What does seemly mean? Line 24. Okay. Let's have a look at line 24 and find out. So this is another super short one, but it's another really hard one because if you don't know the word, it's difficult to work out. Let's have a go. Let's imagine that we don't know what seemly means and we have to work it out here. So the girl laughed and gazed down at her home. Always look at the context, don't just jump to the word. It was a squat gray building halfway between the red tour and the distant bridge, okay? It stood amid bright green crofts, whatever that means. Um, you look it up, it won't help you with everything. And beside it was a seemly hayrick and an unseemly, might help us, patch of rufous light that stared hideous as a bloodshot eye from the harmonious textures of the waste. 
So we don't know what seemly is, but we know that something described as unse unseemly is hideous, like a bloodshot eye, and not harmonious. So it's something that, what is it? There is a ship and under an iron roof sank to rusty dissolution. Okay, so a building falling apart is unseemly. So seemly must be a word that wouldn't describe a building falling apart. So it must be a positive word showing something that's, that's neat or not broken or intact, something like that. Hmm. Seemly, it's about something that seems in a certain way, isn't it? It's got the word seem inside it. A seemly hayrick. So it seems, hmm, what can we do with this? Well, it seems right, because the other thing seems not right. So it's kind of, it's appropriate, it's respectable, might be good guesses. They would also be correct guesses, okay? Seemly means appropriate or respectable. Um, someone said, well, if some, someone's just copying and pasting the dictionary, that's not very useful. You would have a dictionary exam, we need to work this out. Um, decorative, it can mean something along those lines, but almost. I mean, you'd get the mark for that, don't get me wrong, but it's a bit more like appropriate, um, if we're going to be precise about it. So if you wrote something like respectable or appropriate, now the, sentence, the question doesn't say write down, so um, so in theory maybe you should write a sentence such, such as it means, yeah, so let's do that. It means respectable, let's go with that. Anything like respectable, elegant, neat, tidy, um, well presented, decorative, anything like that should be okay for the mark here. Um, but yeah, unseemly would mean inappropriate, a little bit rude, not what you want in this kind of occasion. Um, he walked into the party and made an unseemly display of himself. As you see how he was dressed, gosh, and the way he talked. God, really can't be having people like that. Okay, you can imagine that kind of conversation, the word unseemly being used. I don't know where I came up with all that, goodness me. Um, I'm very theatrical this evening, evidently. Um, it must be the tea or the alpaca. What looks hideous as a bloodshot eye and why does it look like this? We just answered this, okay? Um, so we are talking about, yeah, what is it? It is the shippen. Uh, why does it look... Um, like, why does it look as hideous as a bloodshot eye? Well, it looks hideous because it sank, should give you a clue, even if you don't know the word, the word dissolution, because if a building sinks, it means it's fallen down, right? So that should hint to you that dissolution means decay. See how far you can get with words. That you, someone asked earlier, what happens if you don't know a word? But if you know other words, then you can work them out because you are clever people. So dissolution, even if you don't know it, you can get from sank. But you might also get it from a word like dissolve, okay, which looks really similar for most of the word, because if a building dissolves, it is not in a good way. So it must be falling down and coming apart, okay? That's what your intelligence can do. Um, um, Resetic, thank you for being so diplomatic at writing. Sorry if you found me rude, I answered your question. Um, you've said to somebody, I don't know what, I haven't been following the conversation, but that's a really nice way to deal with the dispute, so my respect. Right, anyway, what are we saying here? We're wondering why, yep, I got distracted by all that niceness. Um, yes, it looks as hideous as a bloodshot eye because it's rusty and falling apart. Rusty, bloodshot, falling apart, hideous, I would guess. So we need to plunge in and be really succinct here. We've only got one line to get two marks, so what is the first part? The shippen, that's a quote. Now, you probably don't know what a shippen is, actually, it's an animal shed. Um, it doesn't matter if you don't know what it is, you just need to identify that that's what we're talking about, because you don't need to write in your own words here. The shippen, um, yeah, looks hideous as a bloodshot eye. You don't need to repeat the question, okay? Important comprehension tip, do not waste time repeating the question. It looks like this, much quicker than repeating hideous as a bloodshot eye. The shippen, Oh no, I've missed out a word. I am a klutz. There we are. Shippen looks like the klutz. Does that come from Yiddish? I think it might. It's a nice word anyway. It means a clumsy person. The shippen looks like this. Um, because it 
is okay so bloodshot because it is rusty rusty I think is a quote from the passage it is rusty and the hideous bit because it's falling apart dissolving collapsing okay that's the word for a building isn't it falling down collapsing and now we've got a really good answer that um, deals with all this this ship and looks like this because it is rusty and collapsing okay grand we're almost there why is the sturdy youth sad what is his name so easy questions if you have read the whole passage and that's what we are focusing on here why is he sad well you know this already if you've read the text properly and taken the time to think what is going on broadly speaking so he says i axed father okay so that's a common mispronunciation of asked which we the um the author is writing down accent here so he says asked as axed um so mispronunciation or just a regional pronunciation rather than, being, rather than judging it so I asked father in plain words if I might be token to you you might not know what that means but you can guess it and you can work it out if you read on you see he was terrible up in years before he got married himself and so he thinks a man's a fool to go into it young okay so he asked his father if he could marry this girl who's called Millie and he said no getting married young is stupid okay um, so he is sad about this. He's sad because his dad won't let him get married. But because we're writing formally, we will say father rather than dad. It's a slightly more formal term. So, um, um, in fact, no. Let's not say. Let's not start with because. I think it's fine, but some people don't like that. I think it's a bit too sloppy. Let's just say his father. Um, won't let him marry or get married means the same thing so simple what is his first name now that should be so easy but it requires you to have read the toll text really carefully because you don't get to this name until we are down here and the first reference to it is him imagining his father calling to him where be Rupert to okay and then Millie addresses him Mr. Baskerville's frightened of losing you from Cadworthy. It must be the farm, Rupert. So the reason, Millie thinks the reason that his father won't let him marry her is because he's worried about him going away and not helping him anymore because his brother's useless, uh, basically. So what's his first name? His first name, of course, is Rupert. So this lesson has, in a way, been a bit of a warning, which is that just because things look easy, it by no means means that they are. Because things that look easy can be deceptive and deceptively difficult. Another thing I hope you've really grasped from this is that you must read the whole text before you start answering the questions or you would have made a disaster of this exercise because the information was a bit here there and everywhere the questions weren't telling you where to find things so locating the information the evidence was hard but not if you knew the text well so again read the text before you come to the questions and look carefully for who are the main characters what is going on where are the main things happening in the story Okay, those are the main things to look for when you read a text before you start answering the questions. Um, absolutely crucial. Um, yeah, and then analyze the questions carefully, work out exactly what's needed. And as I always say with comprehension, imagine your friend sitting there and explain things to them as simply as you can. And that is how you need to write your answers. Wah! Many other things I could say, but that will do. And if you want more tips, rewind. And you can watch through again. Let's get on to the so people who've had January exams they are now largely over you have my sympathy if your exams aren't quite over but let's imagine that most people most of the people watching this their exams are finished um, or well if your exams are finished well done for watching it but probably you're somebody whose exams haven't started yet and they're happening in the autumn so September or October or they're probably happening next January um, or they're even further away, in which case you're fantastically prepared if you're watching this. So you've got quite a while ahead of you. But those months will speed by. So I just simply want to say that now is the time to start thinking seriously about where the gaps in your skills and knowledge are. 
and start writing lists of them and thinking, right, I have a weakness in dividing fractions. And so I'm going to do a bit of extra work on that now so that that isn't still a gap when the, exam's, when the exam is right there. Or to think, I have a bit of a problem with my spellings. So, as I've often suggested in my videos, I'm going to write a list of my 50 most common spelling mistakes and I'm going to learn them to death. And then all my spellings will improve dramatically if I learn those 50. So now is the time to take those useful steps so that your exam preparation isn't stressful when the exams are near. Resthetic says, I have done exams, you made me do good. Um, I am very pleased that I was able to help. Thank you. Um, and help you to do well. Well, adverb. Um, Raven wants to shout out. Hey, Raven. Um, yeah, and who says, someone who says, um, avocado seedly, or avocado seedly. I like that. Um, I like that username. It's good. It's a good name. Uh, says that their exams are in October. So you're exactly the person I'm talking to here. Right. Enough other people talking there. Oh, uh, says you've got my silver course. Fantastic. I hope it's useful. Um, so, um, yeah, I must know who you are, but just not by that name. Right. Um, let us jump into the question section. Well, I hope I've dealt with John's question from the top of the program, where he talked about, he asked what to do if uh, his son was finding these easy questions difficult. Uh, the answer was to realize that they are not by any means easy questions and your son is probably doing fine. And I've said plenty of other, I've given lots of other tips about comprehension, so you've got the idea there. Um, oh, so many people asking for shout outs. Uh, PLE, yes, I've given you loads of shout outs. Um, Honorada, a shout out for you. Okay, 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 okay. Yes, yeah, I wants merch. I know you want merchandise. I want to give you merchandise, but I just have so much on. I haven't got around to it yet, okay? My life is so busy. Um, moving to this new house and I've still got piles of boxes that haven't been unpacked in the cellar. I brought up three the other day and they're still sitting there by the door waiting to be emptied. Give me a chance to make this merch for you. Um, uh, do, do, do. um, Someone asking a question about specific schools, what comes in the St. Olaf's exam. Um, they have in the past quite often set quite difficult comprehensions about poems. Um, that's one thing I'm aware of. We have to write really quite long answers, almost a bit 13 plusy. Really interesting exams, but challenging. There are some resources for St. Olaf's in 11 plus Lifeline, actually, if you're interested in looking at that. Links in the video description. Um, also writing a, a good question here from uh, yeah, Namada, Namada Vinod. Um, should you write a list of things like simile alliteration, colour words, etc. every time you write in English. <coughs> um, well, teachers will give different opinions about this, so you can choose whether to agree with me, but I definitely have an answer to this, which is no, not on your Nelly should you do that. Um, writing is not painting by numbers and you shouldn't do creative writing from lists. You should learn to express the ideas that you want to express in the best way and not go through a list going, oh, I need to add a simile. And then you add a simile and it's rubbish because your heart isn't in it. Or you do alliteration for the sake of it, which is a stupendously silly, and I need to find another S word because I'm doing alliteration. Um, um, subject choice, but subject is the wrong word here. And yes, I met, no, don't do alliteration because it's on your list. Alliterate if it's the right thing to do and for no other reason, and so on. And definitely don't have a list of your favorite words that you have to squeeze into every bit of writing. That's a terrible way to learn to write. You need to learn to find the right word for each thing that you want to say. Yeah, if you've done no writing practice and your exam is two weeks away and suddenly you decide to learn to write, then maybe you're going to use awful cheats like this. But unless that's you, if you've got time to prepare, which you do, then learn to write well and do not write from some awful list. You can always spot when someone is writing from a list because they write badly as though they're doing the techniques because they're trying to tick them off and not because they care. I hate that kind of writing. Please do not be that person. Okay, if your teacher disagrees with me, then probably do what they say because they're your teacher. I have a strong opinion about this topic, as you may have gathered. Um, what is the best grammar school in England? Um, honestly, there is no answer to this question. Um, some grammar school, I can't remember which, did best in the last league tables. That is one answer to the question. 
But if you are not someone who gets on well with that school and likes it and likes the atmosphere and the style of teaching, that will not be the best school for you. And some school that isn't even in the first page of the league tables might be, or isn't even in the fifth page of the league tables, might be the best school for you for all kinds of reasons. The best school is a school where you feel happy and comfortable and where you can produce the best of yourself academically, but also as a person who contributes to that community. And that is the best school in England for you. And all the rest does not matter. So best is not a useful... It's like saying, who is the best person watching this channel? It's no such thing. It's, it's meaningless. Um, you can only say best if there's some criterion like, I don't know, who is the who was the best candidate in last year's maths GCSE? And then, yeah, it's sure, the person who got the highest mask mark was the best candidate. Fine, you can assess that. But things like best school, you cannot assess. There's no such thing. Um, whew, how can you put... Great question from Yadav Patwa. Some good questions, actually, about word choice here. How can you pull out good words when you need them? Um, by pra Through practice, really. You need to avoid to use those words lots of times in lots of different situations when you're talking to people, when you're writing. And then when you're looking for the best word in a certain situation, not the most impressive word, the best word to do a job, which might be a simple word, um, the word has a good chance of coming to mind. Whereas if you just learnt it the day before, it might not come to mind. So practice is the key thing here. The other thing is knowing words really well. Not just having a vague idea of what a word means, but really understanding it. And then again, it's likely to come to mind in, um, you know, it's likely to come to mind as an appropriate word in a relevant situation. Uh, great question. How do you do well in the interview? I, I, I think I answered this last time. I'll do it anyway because no people have got interviews at the moment. Uh, my main bit of advice for interviews I always give is give lots of examples. Okay? So don't say, I like reading. Say, I like reading. And last week I read book X, which I really enjoyed because of this character who was interesting because they reminded me a little bit of myself in certain ways, but they made different choices. And those choices made me question the way that I react in situations like blah, blah, blah. Um, and so I found this book absolutely fascinating. See what you've done there. OK, you just gave an example of a book, then you gave an example of what was interesting about it, then you gave an example of how that related to your life. You've given a chain of examples which have made you sound like an absolute genius, OK? But all you did was give examples. So give examples for what you say and the schools will collapse at your feet in ecstasy that you should be applying to them. Um, that's the most important thing. Another thing I think is really important is when you go for interview, be really kind and considerate to the other people who are there being interviewed so that they feel good about what they're doing, especially if you're in group interviews, but just in general when you meet them. People will notice this kind of thing. It will reflect well on you. It will make the school more likely to want you. But also it's just a good thing to do because interviews are stressful and if you can help other people to feel better about themselves, you are doing a good thing for the world. You probably won't help them to get in and steal your place. It's not like that. Um, so yeah, give examples and be kind. Um, two main things. Um, how to avoid silly mistake? Practice. Okay. Easy answer. Let's be more specific. You need to learn what kinds of silly mistakes you tend to make. What are your silly mistakes? In what ways are you Yadav Patwa? In what ways are you a silly person? So have your own silly person list and then when you're doing an exam look out for those things that are likely to be silly mistakes. So for example maybe you are somebody who readily confuses the spellings um, or the punctuation of its and it's. Okay, what's the difference between these things? It's is short for it is, and it means of or belonging to it. Okay, people get those the wrong way around. If you're somebody who gets those the wrong way around, then that should be on your I'm a silly person list. And every time the word it's comes up in a piece of your writing, you need a oh, silly person list. Have I done this right? So that's how you avoid silly mistakes. Not what am I doing? Um, <laughs> buttons, buttons. You need to know what your silly mistakes are and not make them. Really good question. Quite a simple answer. 
now you need to do it. Right, I'm going to wrap up very soon. We've gone on for long enough. Um, do 11 plus, do interviews. Um, uh, it depends on the school, and it's more in independent schools by and large that they use interviews. Um, some schools, if you get through the exam, then they interview everybody and, and use that to select more people. What I think is a little bit more common in more schools is that they use interviews for the borderline cases. So let's say that um, you know they've got 100 places and the 80 people who do best, they just offer places to in the exam. They don't bother interviewing them. But then the next 40 people, so kind of 20 people who just got the mark and 20 people who just didn't, they interview all of them to see who's going to get on best at the school. Because they understand that the fact that one person got 1% over the pass mark and one person got 1% under the pass mark doesn't actually mean that one person is cleverer than the other or that they're necessarily going to do better at the school. So they talk to people to learn more about them and make a better choice about who to offer a place to. So that's the most common way that interviews are used, but it's generally in independent schools rather than grammar schools. Um, what's a good mark? It just depends, sorry. Um, I've answered that before in more detail, but really it just depends. There isn't an answer. It depends on the school, it depends on the exam paper, it depends on blah, 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 blah. Um, I'm going to wrap it up there. There were good questions here. You can ask them next time. Uh, we've done enough. This lesson is long enough. It's been wonderful to have you here. Thank you. Come back for my next live lesson next week. Look out for my short lessons on the channel. Please subscribe. And if you've got time now, why not hang on and move on to another video in my channel and learn even more. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye.